and the people that will be uh, helping us out. A couple of minor rules. One is if you could hold your questions till the end and they'll answer anything that you'd like. And the second is the slides that you're going to see will be available next week on the Florida Realtor website. Before we get started, a person who is going to speak to us but move to a different role. You and I are so fortunate that our brand new CEO of Florida Realtors is Margie Grant. Margie is right here. Margie. Our first speaker is going to be Ann Cocaine. Ann's been with Florida Realtors for 34 years. She is the director of policy services. Ann, would you come up? I have to tell you that my friend Marcia Tabak, who has about as many decades here as I have, had a unique introduction plan. I can't squeeze it out of her yet, but it's going to happen. And if just a little side note, if Marky Grant says that she'll come visit you, do not talk to her. Talk to me. <laughs> She's bad with calendaring. She ends up in one end of the state when she's supposed to be another end of the state. But that's okay. So I'm here to talk about, oops, good, I skipped my name. Um, I'm here to talk about code of ethics changes by the National Association of Realtors. And one of the things I do is I work on the legal hotline. I'm not an attorney, that is my disclaimer. And I got to call some folks back who needed some callbacks. And one of the callbacks today has something to do with standard of practice 1-7. She's trying to get her offer through and find out the status of her offer. And guess what? It's a one-man shop and nobody's talking to her. I don't think that's ever happened to any of you, has it? <laughs> yeah, it's happened. So what does standard of practice, it's under Article 1, which says we'll promote and protect and serve our customer and our client. So it currently says it requires listing brokers to submit all offers and counter offers until closing or lease is executed other, unless otherwise instructed by the seller or the landlord. We all know that one, right? Okay, good. Now there's been a change. And it's important to notice the year of the change. It's going to become effective on January the 1st, 2019. And it says, and can those of you in the back of the room see this? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to just read slides, but I want to make sure that you hear it. I'll go ahead and share it with you. Upon the request of a cooperating broker who submits an offer to the listing broker, the listing broker shall, and I underscored that, shall provide written affirmation to the cooperating broker stating that the offer has been submitted. Okay, that's important. To the seller or a written notification that the seller has waived the obligation to have the offer presented. Now that's kind of cool, huh? So hopefully it will help some of you because in the caller I had this, mor this, after this morning, she, that was her big issue. She doesn't know what's going on with her offer. But there's a few things you should know about this change. Number one, the listing broker is not obligated to tell you automatically they have presented your offer. You have to ask them. You have to ask them. Secondly, upon request is a bit subjective. There is no time frame. I've talked with the National Association of Realtors. That would have to be discovered by a hearing panel based on evidence and testimony as to whether or not it was submit, submitted upon request. And finally, this is the part you cannot ask. You can't ask them to have the seller sign off on this or send you something in writing that the seller has signed to acknowledge they've received it. The responsibility is on the realtor, not the consumer. And the listing broker's response is sufficient. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> what do you think I feel what you're thinking? Hmm? What if they just type a little email and send it off? Am I not reading your minds? Okay. Well, you're not going to know till after the relationship between the seller and the listing broker is over to find out if they actually did receive your offer. But we hope this will help a little bit. 
Okay, let's move on to hearings. Some of us are brokers, right? And some of you, and do not raise your hand, um, some of you have sat in hearings with your agents who are the respondent, the person who the complaint is being filed against. NAR has amended its policy only to clarify the role of the respondent's broker. Usually it just said in the book, well, we're going to send you this paperwork so you're aware of what's going on and you're invited to come to the hearing. Now they're spelling out exactly what the respondent's broker can do and it's to be, they have a right to be present and receive uh, written notice. They also uh, can make opening and closing statements, kind of do what the respondent can do if they want to and they can respond directly to the questions by the panel. Now what happens if the sales associate is a complainant? If they're a complainant, it, the story is a little bit different. They may allow their broker to receive the documentation from the board regarding the complaint that they have filed, unless the broker is a co-complainant. The broker may appear only as a witness, which means they have to leave the room after they've testified, or as realtor counsel. Does everyone know what a realtor counsel is? You can do this, that's fine. <laughs> Basically what Realtor Council does is they kind of do the same things that we just outlined as a respondents broker and assist. They're a realtor, they don't have to be involved with the case, they can just be an assistant, but they can't do the one thing the folks to the right of me can do, and that is practice law. And now finally on to publishing violators. That's an interesting one. We've had that rule for a while. And I'm going to kind of look out there and see how many of you remember the Freck newsletters that used to come out years ago. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You're, I'm talking about that little column off to the right that said this is what somebody did wrong. And how many of you love to read that? Yeah, yeah, I know you did. I did too. Um, but anyway, publishing violators has been around. Option one, there has been a slight tweak to that, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's frequency based, meaning how many times have you been caught violating the code? And in this case, it says two violations that occur within a three year period. The firm is not named, and the publication must be on to realtors only. It can be on the realtor side of the website at the board, it can be in a newsletter, but it can't be on the public facing side. Now, they're also adding in uh, citation discipline now. That won't take place till after your board of directors, and your board of directors have to adopt this. This isn't just something we automatically do. And so you can include citation policy as long as your board has adopted citation policy that allows this. Everybody with me? Okay, now NER has added an extra layer to the onion, basically by saying we're going to add option two, which builds on option one. So some of the things that you see under option one will also be under option two. This is based on discipline, not based on twice in a three year period. Name, photo. Articles violated along with a description of the violation with all names redacted except the realtor who's in trouble and the discipline imposed. It's kind of like taking that ethics decision and publishing it but using the black magic marker to cross out the names. So that's new. I don't know how many folks are going to pose for the photo, but it is something that they do, they do say you can include. Also, the occurs in instances where there's a letter of reprimand, there's a fine, there's suspension or termination. For my folks who serve on professional standards committees, you are going to notice there's two disciplines that are missing, correct? They are letter of warning and, and going to a class. If that's all they get, they don't end up on the rogues gallery. Okay, so those are the things, understand, and I want you to notice one thing, and I know the folks in the back of the room that you're, you may not be able to see this, it says in all instances, we can't pick and choose who gets the special treatment, everybody who qualifies gets it. 
And under option two, if you're going to adopt it, you're going to have to remember your board legal counsel must review it before it goes forward for adoption by your board. And that's the latest and greatest. Um, for those of you probably wondering, these wonderful slides will be on Florida Realtors' website. So you don't have to take pictures. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Our next speaker is Meredith Caruso. Meredith is a senior attorney with Florida Realtors, a manager of member legal communications. She oversees all forms of production for us and the articles that are in Florida Realtor Legal News. She's a legal liaison for Florida Realtors Disaster Relief Fund and a graduate of Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, and Stetson University College of Law. Meredith. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'm here to do a brief update on fair housing as well as service animals, which is a very hot topic based on our legal hotline. So, just as a general overview, protected classes under federal law, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, otherwise known as handicapped, or familial status. Anything else, here's what we're talking about. You need to also check with your county or city um, as several have extended additional fair housing protections beyond those under federal law. So if you are in the practice of handling rentals as well as handling uh, sales, you are obviously going to want to make sure that you're on top of those so that you aren't putting something inadvertently maybe in the MLS or any other publication that could violate county or city uh, rules regarding this. Some other protections that we've heard of around the state include gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, source of income such as Section 8, victims of dating violence, domestic violence, or stalking, as well as political affiliation. Um, some exemptions, there are some. One of the big ones is 55 plus housing. Um, I'm not going to touch too much on this, but you, you know, the, as some of the communities can qualify as an exemption, meaning they could say no children um, if they qualify under that. Um, there's a statute, which is Florida Statute 760.02, which goes over those. So, um, like Ann mentioned, we are going to have the slides up on the uh, website next week, so that's certainly a good resource for you. What is a handicap? This is an interesting topic, and we get this question a lot. Under federal law, the definition is also interchangeable, as I mentioned, with disability, and it's any person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life activities, has a record of such impairment, or is regarded as having such impairment. So basically what this goes into is they actually define under federal law uh, such, such examples like chronic alcoholism, mobile, mobility and visual impairment, chronic mental illness, AIDS, mental retardation, or something else that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And a major life activity includes obviously walking, talking, hearing, seeing, breathing, learning, performing manual tasks, and caring for oneself. So in my opinion, that's fairly broad. Here we go on to service animals. How many people have questions about service animals? <laughs> All right, let's see if we can't hopefully address some of these. Um, landlords are required to provide a reasonable accommodation for individuals who require assistance animals. You can't charge a, a tenant a pet fee um, or a deposit for a service animal, but the tenant could be liable for damages that the uh, animal causes to the property. So, um, if, for instance, if you had a service animal and they scratched up the wood floor, they could make a claim on the security deposit for those damages. But again, no pet deposit, uh, and um, uh, as far as the, uh, the pet fee either. Also, um, you have to do this on an individualized assessment. You can't say across the board, obviously, to determine whether someone has a disability-related need for that assistance animal. We always suggest that if you're property managers or as well as that, you know, be mindful of this and look at each person individually as far as covering that. So, I know this is a hot topic and we do, like I said, get tons of questions on this on the legal hotline. I know yesterday out 
even just out in the lobby, uh, we had a line of people that were asking the attorney that was on exact same questions on this. So um, again, make sure you check with your cities and counties regarding fair housing, any additional restrictions, and be mindful of people that may present themselves with a service animal as to what the restrictions and what you're able to uh, ask in accordance with that. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Our next speaker, and an old friend of Florida Realtors, not old chronologically, but old friend that we've known you a long time, is Joanna Watkins, a native of Pensacola, Florida. She's a graduate of Florida A&M and Florida State University College of Law. Moved to Central Florida in 1999, where she began her career in law as an assistant public defender with the Orange County Public Defender's Office. Loved real estate, and after joining the Division of Real Estate as a senior attorney, spent 16 years there and was appointed director by Governor Scott. We're lucky to have you back. She now serves as an attorney for Florida Realtors as Associate General Counsel. She says the highlight of her career was an appointment to the Federal Advisor Committee on the Appraisal Subcommittee of U.S. Congress. She promotes autism awareness and enjoys spending time with her family, and we're lucky that we're a part of your family. Joanna? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Hi. Let's wake up. So um, my very first week back in law and policy, Margie was so generous in assigning me a trip to Washington, D.C. to attend a riveting workshop with two federal agencies. Um, we went to hear them talk about brokerage competition in the real estate industry. And so some of you may remember that uh, in 2008 or so, there was a consent agreement between the National Association of Realtors and uh, the Department of Justice with respect to vows. And so fast forward 10 years, that agreement is coming to an end. And so the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission held this workshop on June 5th in 2018, uh, 2018 in D.C. And what you have on the slide um, is four of the main topics that were covered that day. There were tons of topics covered, but they all dealt with uh, competition in the real estate brokerage industry. And so uh, the four highlights we have here is the real estate innovation road, how far we've traveled, listing data, emerging technology, and the structure of real estate markets, developments in real estate fee and service models, and regulatory and industry factors affecting residential real estate competition. So it was a full day workshop. There were a variety of speakers that came before us in panel format. Uh, National Association of Realtors was well represented, obviously, by its general counsel. Uh, Inman uh, had representation there, as well as Redfish, Zillow, Realtor.com, ERA Franchise Systems, Purple Bricks, which is actually a company that started out of the UK. They also do business in Australia and America now. Um, Glass House Real Estate, Tree Laura, which if you notice is an anagram for realtor. He did that on purpose. And uh, as well as California Regional MLS, Cornell University, Consumer Federation of America, Texas A&M University School of Law. And we actually had an opening from the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, so they took this event very seriously, as well as a closing by Robert Porter, who was the chief of the antitrust division at the Department of Justice. So what do we talk about specifically? Well, we talked a lot about existing and emerging platforms for consumer access to listing information. And there the emphasis was on the fact that uh, one of the gentlemen described it best by saying that 22 years ago when I first started in this business, every Thursday we'd have these huge books wheeled into our offices and our agents would look through the listings and we had an agreement that we would never share these listing, um, in, this li listing information with our buyers. And so he says, and so fast forward, today we have more than ever all of these platforms that provide buyers with information regarding listings, okay? So they talked a lot about the differences over the last couple of decades and how consumers access information with respect to listings. We also talked about changes in traditional real estate brokerage um, and multiple listing service practices. There they talked a lot about access to information, how we should, um, be more open with the information that is available, particularly in MLS. Believe it or not, there was a lot of discussion about 
Should we share commissions um, with the consumers when they're accessing listing information, actual consumer uh, commission information? We talked about the emergence and growth of non-traditional fee and service models. So keep in mind these were panels, and so you had everyone from ERA with more than 40 years of experience in the business to fairly new startup companies like the Purple Bricks who have been around for a while but are just now making their presence known in the United States. Um, these different service providers offered a variety of uh, approaches to not just agent compensation but also consumer fees. So you had some brokers on the panel who had agents who are actual employees, some who are independent contractors. You had uh, offices that offered flat fee or capped services on one side of the transaction but not the other, and then you had agents uh, who offered uh, flat fee to both sides of the deal. Uh, so it, there was a lot of variety and they all went to great detail explaining how it is they charge their customers and how it is they employ and compensate their agents. And finally, we had regulatory and licensing uh, regimes related to the residential real estate transaction. So they talked a lot, many of these providers offered rebates and things like that that are also subject to regulatory restrictions in various jurisdictions. Um, you know, Florida has our rule where you can share compensation with the customer so long as it's fully disclosed to all interested parties. So they talked about their experiences in various markets throughout the United States and um, making sure that they comply with the regulations that are either existing or being proposed. So what's next? What's on the horizon? Well, you know, you could look at this workshop as just a time to kind of clear the air, find out where we've come in the last 10 years. The gentleman who closed, the bureau chief for the antitrust division, actually joked, and so when we're here 10 years from now, I'm sure we'll be talking about the same things. You can take that as a joke, as an innocent conversation, or you could say perhaps they will continue over the next 10 years to pay very close attention to compens uh, compensation and fees and various service models throughout the real estate industry. So his closing remarks provided this guidance to us. They will be paying close attention to diverse perspective on the state of competition, particularly with respect to compensation. Innovative fee and service models are being encouraged. Focus on issues critical to customers and the consumers, particularly lower prices, higher quality, more innovation, and greater choice. Um, I, I just want to leave you with, with kind of my takeaway. Please remember that whether it is a traditional full service model or a limited service, flat fee, cap fee, model, whatever the case may be, we want to embrace all of our various service providers and models. Uh, that is clearly the takeaway from this workshop. If you are interested and you're having trouble sleeping one night, um, <laughs> public comments are archived on the FTC website. Uh, they accepted them until July 31st, so the closing the period has closed. But there is a uh, uh, a wide variety of comments representing all the various stakeholders within the real estate industry in the United States. I would encourage you to take a look at them if you do actually have some time and don't find federal law to be extraordinarily boring uh, because some of the comments are very interested and re very relevant to what you face every single day. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Joel Maxson. Joel manages the Florida Realtors Hotline and provides legal updates and training to members throughout the state. He received his law degree from the University of Florida. His first law job was as a judge advocate for the United States Marine Corps. Do not mess with Joel. <laughs> Worked as a transaction real estate attorney for a national firm before finding his home with us here at Florida Realtors. Joel, it's a pleasure. So I recently read a book, uh, Ready Player One. Uh, for those of you who have read it or seen the movie, it's just steeped in nostalgia from the 80s. Really took me back, uh, particularly video games since the Ready Player One. Uh, the coin-op days, the Atari, the Nintendo. Um, and if you fast forward to where we are today, as I'm looking around this room, I see things in your hands that are light years ahead of everything that was mentioned in that book. 
Um, and as technology advances, let me get a starting point, as technology advances, it's given you tools as realtors to market yourself and uh, get your name out there and get it in front of people in scores of different ways. And as you've gotten that ability to reach in and get to your consumers, your prospects, your people, the government at different levels has pushed back and said, hold on a second. As you're doing that, we want to protect the privacy of our uh, consumers, and so we're going to set up some rules and regulations, some fences around what you can do and what you can't do. Now, before I get into this, I'm only going to hit a few of the highlights, but the takeaway and, and something to keep in mind that unlike Fair Housing Act and service animals, which is a subjective standard, subjective in the sense that if you boil it down to its essence, it's saying don't discriminate against these protected classes. What's discrimination? Well, you kind of have to think about that and go, well, you got to apply it. And it could take many different faces, discrimination. This, on the other hand, this technology and these rules they've put to sort of say don't go there, they're objective. So that's a good thing. They're objective rules, so you all, if you're, a, if you're a broker, if you're an office administrator, if you have people looking to you for, for rules, you can create checklists for these things to solve the issue. So these are not unsolvable problems. These are not things that are going to require a little brain power every time an issue presents itself. These are checklist type rules, so that's great news for you all. And I'd highly encourage you, as I'm kind of running through some of these things, to think, do we have a procedure and policy that keeps us safe? And if we don't, maybe we'd think about instituting one. Um, and uh, just to kick off one that I didn't actually put a slide on because we don't get many calls about it. I think you all are very familiar with it. It's a pretty basic rule. One that I don't, I'm not mentioning, but I'll mention it verbally is can spam, can spam act. So if you're going to send emails out to people, fairly straightforward, you always have to, you already have to comply with your advertising rules. It says don't do anything fraudulent, false, deceptive, or misleading. So you're going to be okay on the majority of the rules. Just remember an unsubscribe button at the bottom if this is a commercial email, right? So that, that kind of can spam. I think you all already got that and you know it and you've seen it and even at this point it's almost instinct you know scroll the bottom unsubscribe in addition uh, to can spam we got some other things this TCPA I'm gonna spend a little time on because this one is one that uh, I don't know if it keeps Margie up at night but it definitely is something that's on our radar is oh boy I hope everybody's protecting themselves and that's why I'm covering it uh, TCPA uh, in, in addition to other things it did lead to the creation of the national do not call registry uh, I'm sure many of y'all have experienced it. It's out there. You just uh, government website. You Google it. You get there. You punch in your phone number. Congratulations. Your land, your personal landline or cell phone are now on the Do Not Call registry. Uh, and what it does is, you know, uh, it just basically says Do Not Call. And there's more rules. I'll get into in a sec. It also covers text messages, which is sort of the new er issue that that we definitely want to make sure you're aware of. Text messages using an auto dialer. Um, the regulations also cover robocalls and faxes. I know robocalls is a big thing in the news. I'm not going to cover it. If you do use that, I hope you are aware of what the rules are and you protect yourself on that end. Same thing with faxes. Again, we don't get, I, I can't, robocall, fax, and can spam, I can't think of a single hotline call I've had. So that's why I'm just briefly mentioning all those. Um, now this one, it can be enforced in so many different ways. This is the part that's a little nervous uh, for me. It, private lawsuit. If someone finds out that you violated the TCPA, they can sue you. They can even get a class action together, and they can ask for lots of money, and then maybe they settle, maybe they don't. But they can sue you for money as a private lawsuit. And there is, I'd say there's been a rise. There's been a sort of a spike in plaintiff's attorneys who figured out the formula and said, if we look for this, we can go after people like that. So private lawsuit is, is to me, the biggest threat, why, why I put it first. In addition, the FTC can enforce it. The FCC can enforce it at the federal level, and, of course, the state of Florida. Uh, penalties are up to $1,500 per violation. That's not to scare you. And again, it's, it's actually $500 if it's a run-of-the-mill uh, uh, violation, $1,500 for more a willful one. But I do want to say this is per violation. So the bill can get very steep very fast if you accidentally miss these things. And the other part that also is, is troubling, some, some issues require a mindset. They require you to be malicious uh, in order to violate something. This is a strict liability. This is one where what, they, what the lawyers have to prove is, did it happen? <laughs> you know, so that's also one of the things why we say, look, just have a checklist. All right, let's talk about texting real quick. Uh, first off, consent to receive text is required. Uh, two different types of consent. If it's telemarketing, think cold call. If you're doing a cold call, you need to have a signed written consent, the highest form of consent on, in, on your records. 
If it's a non-telemarketing text, well, those are going to require prior express consent, which, okay, it can be written. I hope it is for your sake. It could be verbal, um, and it could be that they just gave you their phone number and didn't put any restrictions on it. So the non-telemarketing texts, you know, that, that someone didn't ask for, that you're not in a relationship with, uh, you know, those are, uh, do require consent as well. Best practices, of course, use a clearly stated form if you're talking about the uh, telemarketing kind. If you do use verbal follow-up, this is a great, uh, great thing that I do frequently. You have a verbal conversation that's important, follow it up with a quick email. Say, here's what I remember we said. Does a couple of great things. If they don't remember it the same way, it gives them an immediate chance to correct you. Uh, if they do remember it the same way or if they don't speak up, you've got your written record of what happened. Um, and the last one, include the consent language on sort of your standard forms. Uh, just an example of what I'm talking about. When I go to the dentist or when I went to the dentist, I put my number down with all my other information. And somewhere in there it said, hey, we're going to give you updates through your cell phone. In addition to getting consent, you do need to give them a way to opt out. Uh, customers can revoke uh, and, and their, uh, their consent and opt out in any way that is reasonable, so however they want to do it. But best practices enable them to, to do something simple like text back to say stop. Um, that's what, using my dentist as the example, that's what they do. I get a reminder, hey, your dentist appointment's coming up, it's on Wednesday, and at the bottom it says, if you don't want to get any more of these texts, just reply stop. So they've, did, they've, they've done this best practice. Uh, it's the best example, or it's the most one that came to my mind. Of course, promptly honor all requests and keep a record. Next, do not call. Uh, most of you who do call and make cold calls are familiar with this and hopefully do have a policy in place, but the do not call, uh, it, of course, allows the consumers to have their, their numbers on there. Um, right now, the phone numbers stay on there permanently. Originally, it was for five years, then you have to go reapply. As of now, it's out there and it's on there in the National Registry. In addition to the National, Florida does maintain its own. Now there are some exemptions, I just kind of put them on here just for your uh, heads up. A couple of them that will come into play, uh, business to business. If you're calling another business, they're not, they're not on the do not call. Do not call is for consumers, private people, landlines and cell phones. Um, if you do have an established prior business relationship, these are, you know, of our calls, the hotline, these are probably the two most popular ones. If you do have a prior business relationship, it's okay to call someone within 18 months uh, after you've, you know, preceding the call, you know, that you've had the relationship. Uh, the next one, of course, they give written permission. That's always okay. Informational calls, survey, political calls, and then nonprofits. Nonprofits are, uh, have their own exemption if they're soliciting charitable donations. There is a safe harbor, and this is to me the most important part. Kind of ties in with the theme that I've got. The safe harbor is write it down, have a policy, follow it. <laughs> All right, but in in detail, the safe harbor for TCPA, which and a safe harbor, by the way, means okay. What if you slip up? Well, if you slip up, you're okay if you've already done these things. First, have written procedures. Second, train people in your office. Train people on your team. Whoever you're responsible for, make sure they're trained uh, to follow the procedures. Third, monitor and enforce. So write it, train them on it, monitor and enforce. And then, of course, to maintain the company-specific list of, of phone numbers. Scrub it every 31 days. And then the final one, of course, should be obvious. Uh, it, it needs to be an accident that they someone violated the do not call rules. If it's intentional, you're not going to get to take advantage of the safe harbor. Uh, last one, and I just put this on here. Uh, this may not apply to many of you, but I use it as an example of another sort of technology-driven rule and see kind of what our friends across the pond are doing. Uh, they're getting a little more aggressive. Uh, matter of fact, they're getting quite aggressive. The EU has a general data protection regulation that's effective as of May 25. And again, it does apply to you if you are getting data on people from the European Union. Uh, if you collect their data, those consumers have the right of access. If they ask you for what data you have on them, you've got to give it to them. They've got a right of rectification. If you give them a copy and they say, well, this isn't, isn't right, you've got to follow their instructions and correct it. Erasure, I like that. Not just a band from the 80s, but it is, a, uh, it is a right for them to have you delete their personal data. Say, nope, I want to be forgotten, take it out. It, uh, they can object, uh, they can restrict how you process it, they can object to how you process it. Again, they can they control what you do with their data. And then finally, data portability. If they ask for a copy, you got to say, here's what I've got. So they've obviously gone pretty far uh, past our rules, but I do want you to be aware of it, both in case you are reaching out and keeping data on European Union residents, and just so you can kind of see what's out there uh, for, for different jurisdictions. Takeaways, I'm really just kind of summing up the uh, safe harbor, uh, but 
again, like I said, this is an objective rule that you all can solve. This is a solvable puzzle. Highly recommend if, you, if you're going through this and going, I don't know, we just call a legal hotline if we have questions. Well, okay, you may want to write an internal policy and procedure and kind of think of all the stuff, not just what I talk about, but there's anything else you all want to use. If you do want to do, uh, use a robocalling or faxing as part of the marketing, you know, make sure you co cover those too. Uh, but write internal policies and procedures, train your people, and monitor them. So that's my key takeaways. Hopefully you all stay safe out there. We do not want to see you on the news or on the courts. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Joel. And wrapping up, uh, another old friend of Florida Realtors, again, not chronologically, but Marsha has been with us forever. Marsha in a role is a Deputy Legal Counsel for Florida Realtors. Marsha Tabak addresses issues that we face regarding legal risk, contract creation, and inter interpretation, regulatory issues, and professional standards, and most interested in helping you and I stay out of trouble. And Marsha, it's a pleasure to have you up here. So do you see how I'm channeling Maud today? <laughs> I've got the long flowy robes, it's my new look. Okay, so originally I thought I was introducing everybody and I kind of want you guys to get to know my colleagues better. But luckily for me, or, or for you, or for them, Steve handled that. But what I had done was I'd, I wanted to give you some descriptions or some of my little nicknames for people. I'm gonna spare you that with the exception of Margie. So we're all really excited about Margie taking the helm in January. But <laughs> but we weren't shocked or anything. You know, it's sort of a, nat a, nat uh, a natural progression for her. So, you know, like in my mind, my little nickname for her would be the fixer. Now, she doesn't tape your conversations, she doesn't launder money, and she doesn't bodily threaten anybody, but I have seen her threaten people. But she's really, you know, she's the best promoter of a realtor I know, and we're really excited. So, we, hats off to you, girl. Okay, so, what I have been charged uh, to talk with you about today are a couple of cases and a little bit of a freck update. The first case I want to talk to you about, and I'm really excited about this case, is the Diaz versus Koch case. This is a case that came out in May out of the third DCA, and that's in South Florida, okay? This case involved a residential real estate transaction. The buyers no real surprise when you hear all the facts were attorneys okay they said that they were very knowledgeable about uh, real estate they went into a property in Coral Gables liked the property put it under contract and used the Florida Realtors Florida Bar as his contract that was in September of 2012 okay and that property price was two million eight hundred fifty thousand they put down a $50,000 deposit, and they were obligated to put a second deposit down of $235,000 once they got through the inspection period, okay? They go through the inspection period, and on the 10th day, they discover, and they believe they discover that there are a couple of open permits, and they discover that there was some renovation work they believed was performed by the seller without permits. And they lost it, okay? They sent a scathing email to the sellers, reaming them out for inducing them to enter into, to enter into this contract with fraud, claiming they were defrauded, claiming the sellers were in breach of contract. They went up and down the sellers about the fact that there possibly were open permits and possibly some unpermitted work. Now that was on the last day of the inspection period of the ASIS contract. Sent the email and then they went on to say, well, we want to show you we're acting in good faith, seller, so we are going to make our second deposit of $235,000. So they don't cancel the contract and they make the second deposit. 
the parties try to work it out. The seller is very willing to, to dig into their files, to give the, the buyer access to their contractor. Tr the seller's trying in good faith to work this thing through. The buyers couldn't get there. Okay, one month later, the buyer says to the seller, we are not buying. Fine, the seller was okay because the seller had a backup contract. Um, buyer's agent was holding the deposit and asked that the seller sign a release to give the deposit back. The sellers say affirmatively, we are not claiming your deposit, but we are not signing the release. The escrow agent wouldn't release the money, so the buyer then sues the seller. All gloves come off on the seller's part, then they're really upset, because now they're being sued by a buyer, and they weren't trying to get the money, okay? The trial court works through this dispute with the parties for five years. At the end of the matter, the trial court ended up awarding the seller $850,000 for the seller's attorney's fees because these buyers could not contain themselves. They kept amending the, the, uh, the complaint. They kept taking discovery. The thing went on and on. The court looked at the contract, and the court said the buyer had the opportunity to terminate. Remember, they discovered this while they were in the inspection period, and yet they didn't terminate. So the buyers lost, and the, the buyers appealed. Um, the court, this is kind of unusual, the court wrote a 26-page opinion specifying at least 10 or 11 provisions of the contract. And every time the court would talk about the contract, the court would say, this is what the contract provides the buyers failed to follow. In the end, the appellate court upheld the decision and included the language that I have on the screen in its conclusion. And specifically, the court said, the as-is residential contract developed jointly by Florida Realtors and the Florida Bar reflects a middle-of-the-road form intended to reduce the legal fees that could be incurred if purchase contracts started from scratch for each transaction. The form reflects a wealth of experience with both successful and failed transactions among professional realtors and real estate attorneys. So hats off to you guys because you are the ones that constantly contact us and you tell us what's going on with your transactions. When you have a problem with the language, we try to work it out and if we can't work it out, we look at that language when we're reviewing the form every two years. So this is a real uh, compliment to the committee, the Realtor Attorney Committee, and to you and to the Florida Bar. So thank you very much. So the second case I want to talk to you about is um, a case involving a leasing agent. And there is an important lesson for you guys to hear, to take back to your boards, and to your offices. Now this case does turn on its facts. It's very specific about the facts, but the facts could reveal themselves in the future. Okay, this case involved a building. In the building was a family who were tenants in the building. Also in the building, there was a real estate agent who lived there. The family's lease was coming to the end and they wanted to stay in the building, but they couldn't stay in that particular unit. The agent who lived in the building heard about this, this uh, scenario, contacted the tenants and said, I can show you another unit in this building. And sure enough, that's what the, that's what the agent did. So the agent directed the tenants to this property and actually the tenants ended up leasing the property for a two year time frame. They were to pay $7,500 per month to be paid in six months installments. Now, when the couple walked through the property prior to taking possession, they noticed that there were some cosmetic issues that were problematic to them. They said the floors were scuffed and there was some touch-up paint needed. Importantly, the agent says to the tenants, I will get this taken care of. We will fix this before you move in. Now, that did not happen. 
Okay, so the tenants move in, repairs have not yet been made. And unfortunately, after the tenants took occupancy, more problems revealed themselves. There was a significant uh, water damage issue related to a leak in a bathroom, and it caused mold in the ventilation system, and the tenants' kids got sick, okay? They required medicine, and when this happened, the tenants communicated the continuing problem to this agent, because the agent said, let me know. The tenant did not get the repairs done, and ultimately the tenants moved out six months early, sued the agent for failure to repair and for damages. The tenants went on summary judgment, and now on appeal, we need to examine this. The agent said, hey, I'm not negligent. I'm not the one making the repairs. I don't own this place. That was their defense. But the court looked at what the agent had promised the tenants. The agent promised to fix the problems, manage the repairs, and because he made those promises, he had a, a, a duty to exercise reasonable care. The agents made it clear that since they lived in the building together, if there were any issues, come to the agent. The agent said he was the go-to guy. I will take care of it. And as a result, the court said, we're going to use the undertaker's doctrine. It's so apropos. Um, the undertaker's doctrine reads like this. There is liability if you undertake an act, even if it wasn't your original responsibility. You must exercise reasonable care, which results in increased harm, which if it results in increased harm to the beneficiary, you're responsible for. So the, what's the take home lesson here? If you are going to say you're going to take care of something, you are exposing yourself to liability. You're an agent. You're not the owner. Your responsibility is to report this to the owner and get back to the tenant about what the owner plans to do. But be very careful, if at all possible, um, with your words. Okay, we've got three minutes left in, for my portion. I'm going to run through um, some things that are happening at FREC, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, wanted to remind you that the team advertising rule is final. So that rule will actually be enforced by FREC come July 1st of 2019. So you have plenty of time if you're a broker of teams or if you're working in a team to understand this rule and to come into compliance. Um, there are some words that you cannot now use in your team name. So you gotta look at the list of the words. There are words like agency, associates, brokerage, brokers, company, property, properties, real estate. There are words that almost imply that a team could be a brokerage. So you gotta check the words, check the name of your team. Uh, you do not have to indicate in the name of your team the words team or group, but it, the name does need to let people know that you are a team or group. Um, the idea behind this rule was simply that the name of the team in an ad should not exceed the size of the name of the brokerage, and the same is true with the logo. That was the purpose of the rule. Now the broker's going to have some responsibility. The broker must keep a written record of the names of the team's members on a monthly basis. And the team must file with the broker the licensee responsible for the team ads. We don't yet have um, an idea of what the parameters are going to be for violation of this rule. But as soon as we get it, we will let you know. If you have questions about the teams, please send those questions to us, legalnews at floridarealtors.org. Um, we did ask FREC uh, some of the questions that you guys had sent us at the July meeting, and here are some of the answers we got. Um, neither the team website address nor the email address alone, if it's not used in conjunction with advertising, fall within the team rule. So let me, let me go over that. The most common question we got from you dealt with domain names and website names for teams, okay? Everybody with me? And so when we talked to Freck about this, actually we had a conversation with 
them at the July meeting, we asked whether those team names, the, not the team names, the website of the team or the email address of the team had to comply because most of you that have, for example, email addresses, you don't have the name of your brokerage company in there, right? Some do, some don't. So they told us as long as that email address or the website address is not within an ad for a property itself, this rule is not going to apply. Uh, let me see. What if it, okay, if it is, thank you. If you're using a website within an advertisement, the whole ad needs to comply with the team ad rule, okay? You don't have to change the website, but you have to make sure that the size of the team name does not exceed the size of the brokerage name, and the same is true with the logo. Everybody clear? Okay, Steve, I think I can turn that back over to you to give us a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Marcia. Marcia, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. How fortunate we are to have all of you uh, working for us at Florida Realtors. And now it's your turn. Whatever questions you'd like to ask, if you'd uh, come up to the microphone so everybody could hear it, if you could make your way over, please. Thank you. Next question. A couple of months ago, there was a decision in California Supreme Court, uh, Dynamex versus somebody, about independent contractors. And a couple of articles I read that said this may ultimately affect independent contractor status of real estate agents, or there was concern about that. Any thoughts? Call the legal hotline, Jerry. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. So back in the day, when we used to get the violation uh, newsletters that used to come in, and they don't need to take a look at it, and most of the time the accountant would go, oh my, but technology has changed a lot since then. So now we have the ability to tweet, and we have the ability to have Facebook, and we have the ability to share a lot of information that we didn't share a year ago. Is there a guideline on that? Because that's actual information. What kind of specific information um, is it that you're concerned about? Well, you could share the events, the violators, the names, the, the app, the dirty app. Okay. Well, it's a realtor publication for realtors. It does, but is there any guideline that the realtors won't share that? Sure. <laughs> Just yeah, speak right into it. Yes. Speak right into it, right into the mic. Does the agent's name, can the agent's name, if they're not a team, be larger than the company's name? That was my question. Because some people go by their name. 
Joanna, let's give you that one. <laughs> Speak right on the mic. Nancy, no, in your first question, the agent's name, yes. is that agent a member of a team or just an individual? No, an individual, but they mark it by their name. Okay. Um, so you bring up a very good question. In addition to the changes that Fred recently uh, finalized with respect to team names, they have notice for rulemaking the individual uh, advertising or pinpoint advertising. Uh, we are not sure where they will go with that, uh, but they will be having make changes to the individual team name, uh, the individual advertising rules, similar to that of the team advertising rules. So as it currently reads, there's no uh, language addressing the size of that individual's name compared to the broker's name. Um, it just can't be false, misleading, or deceptive. So if the individual's name is so prominent that you can't see the broker's name, that might be a problem in they probably should consider doing that because that's going to be the way around a lot. And, and so there is discussion. There will be discussion, and I'm not sure which upcoming press meeting, but they have noticed that individual advertising rule for discussion. And the second question about having a title that. Juana, for There's example, if I could, let's say it just said director of luxury sales. Mm -hmm. Vice president. And, and we're assuming under those facts that they're giving it to a person who's licensed. Uh, because if they're not licensed, you've got a whole other problem. One of the concerns we've had with respect to the team rule is this branding that many of our agents do, our companies do for our agents, and that's a wonderful thing. It's just in being creative with that terminology, they have to ask themselves, Am I holding myself out to the public as a team? Well, do, I, do I create the impression that this title means that um, I might be a team, or is the title false misleading or deceptive? So I, that's what. Right. I think that's a good article for the realtor because I think many brokers don't understand it. And they're doing that thinking it's a perk, and, and they're violating. Well, we are watching it because of the team advertising. Because some of these special titles and brands that we see are creating the perp, the appearance potentially that uh, they are a business in and of themselves. So we're we're looking at it, and we'll certainly keep you posted. Thank you. And we'll take the last two questions. As you know, attorneys bill by the hour, and their hours about up. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, last two. Yes. Hi, Brown Hill Sports. Um, to on a familiar workshop, one of the things that perked my interest was the publication of conditions. So doctors don't post, waitresses don't post, car salesmen don't post. Why does it always seem like the realtors are held to this different standard and different um, norm and that we're just billionaires and we need to tell everybody so I just, you know, a little light on why is that thinking all the time? Well, I certainly wouldn't uh, dare try to get into the heads of DOJ or FTC. Um, but I will say, having a little bit of experience from a regulator's perspective, once they, once you land on their radar, you're kind of on their radar. And in this instance, it was the vow policy from 2006 or seven or so that put realtors Uh, Ann, Meredith, Joanna, Joel, Marcia, thanks so much for your time.